A team of intrepid scientists have devised an audacious plan to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Their secret weapon? Computation. The very heartbeat of living systems. But what's that? And how will computational zones help us to find extraterrestrial life? Let's find out. In our universe, there are special places called habitable zones. They hold the key to life as we know it. You see, planets are a bit like picky eaters. They have specific preferences for their conditions. Just as we humans need things to survive, planets need their environments to be just right for life to thrive. So, what's the secret recipe for a habitable zone, you ask? It's all about finding that sweet spot where liquid water can exist. Water, as we know, is the magical elixir of life. Planets love to have it flowing or sloshing around on their surfaces. So, we need to find the perfect balance. If a planet is too close to its star, things get toasty, and water evaporates into a sizzling mist. On the flip side, if a planet is too far away, it becomes an icy wasteland, freezing water solid and turning potential life into popsicles. But within that perfect middle zone, also called the Goldilocks zone, temperatures are just right. That means planets have the perfect conditions for life to potentially take root. For a long time, scientists have been looking for planets in these zones. And as of January 2023, we have found a total of 63 potentially habitable exoplanets. However, a recent study has changed our view of where we should look for life. Gone are the days of restricting our search to mere habitable zones. Oh no, we're thinking big. Get ready for the computational zones. These enchanting realms could house life forms we've never even dreamed of encountering before. But what exactly are these computational zones? Well, let's see. When scientists search for life in the universe, they usually look for things similar to what we have here on Earth. They imagine creatures living on a planet's surface at just the right distance from their star and using water for important chemical reactions. But what if life can be much more diverse and fascinating than that? Imagine life using different liquids instead of water. Picture life hiding deep underground in icy moons it's even possible that life doesn't need a star at all. And there might be biological systems that are different from our idea of life in general, but still alive in their own unique way. That's why two clever researchers have come up with a new idea. They want to change how we think about the places where life could exist. Instead of focusing on habitable zones, they suggest looking for computational zones. Think of these computational zones as special kitchens where the secret recipe for life is being prepared. To make this recipe work, we need three key things. First, we need a variety of special ingredients, like different chemicals. Just like a chef needs various spices and flavors to create a delicious dish, life needs different chemicals for its calculations. Second, we need a source of energy, like sunlight or heat from hydrothermal vents. This energy powers the cooking process, just like heat powers a chef's stove. Lastly, we need a dedicated space, like a kitchen counter, where all the calculations can happen. It's the place where the ingredients come together and amazing things start to occur. In our case, it was our solar system and our planet Earth. Basically, computational zones should have three things. Some chemicals, source of energy, and space. This makes a pretty wide sample, isn't it? By focusing on computational zones, the researchers believe we have a better chance of finding signs of life. These zones could lead us to amazing discoveries and show us that life in the universe is much more creative and diverse than we ever imagined. And here's the real mind-boggler. This idea also leads us to think about technology. Yes, AI and stuff. Just as we humans create and use technology, could life itself create its own technological marvels? Life could be biological, digital, or even something completely different. Computational zones give us a fresh way of thinking outside the box and get creative. Now here's another twist in all this research. Turns out that life might be much closer than we think, as if, in our own solar system. It turns out that the insides of icy moons, like Europa or Enceladus, answer to all these conditions. They're just as fascinating as the surface of rocky planets. It's like realizing that hidden treasure lies right beneath our feet. Europa is Jupiter's icy moon, which is as old as our Earth. It looks like a half-sphere with a bright, icy appearance, an off-white color with a hint of blue. Mysterious dark lines stretch across the moon, forming patterns. 
It lacks towering mountains or deep basins, but instead showcases dark ridges, grooves, and long streaks. As you move toward the bottom of the image, Europa fades into darkness, leaving us curious about what lies beyond. But the most important thing about Europa is that it's a fascinating candidate for life. First of all, this moon has liquid water in abundance. Scientists believe that there might be an entire salty ocean beneath its icy surface. There might be twice as much water as all the oceans on Earth combined, but life needs more than just water to exist. It requires certain chemical elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. They're like the building blocks of life. These elements are found throughout the universe and make up a whopping 98% of living matter on Earth. And Europa is believed to have a lot of all these elements too. Perhaps they were brought there in the distant past after a collision with asteroids and comets. Although it's pretty cool that we found organic molecules on Europa, it doesn't automatically mean they are linked to life. These molecules can be created in non-living processes as well, but they still give us some very important clues. And finally, energy. It's like fuel for life. Just like we need food to keep going, all living things need energy to survive. On Earth, plants get their energy from the sun through a cool process called photosynthesis. Plants turn sunlight into food, and when animals eat those plants, they get energy too. But the kind of life that might live on Europa can't rely on sunlight. Europa is covered in a thick layer of ice, so there's no sunshine reaching its surface. Instead, life on Europa would have to find another way to get energy. And that way is through chemical reactions. Europa's surface gets showered by radiation from Jupiter, which is not so great for living things up there, to say the least. However, this radiation can actually be helpful. It helps to create oxygen and hydrogen in Europa's atmosphere. But that's not all. As Europa orbits around Jupiter, it gets flexed and squeezed by the planet's gravity. This flexing generates heat, just like how bending a paperclip can make it warm. The heat from this process can provide energy for life too. So as you can see, Europa's potential life forms have to get creative. But this little moon still has a very high chance of supporting life. It's a fascinating and mysterious world out there. And Saturn's moon Enceladus is also an exciting place where life could thrive. But detecting this life is no easy task. The moon is covered by a thick ice shell with a super deep ocean beneath. Even here on Earth, that would be a huge challenge, let alone on a moon halfway across the solar system. Enceladus is nothing like Earth, so don't expect to find cows and butterflies there. But it would have its own unique ecosystem. Some organisms that rely on chemical reactions for energy. Although life on Enceladus, if it exists, might be extremely scarce. But regardless, we should keep exploring it. Any findings would be helpful for our future missions. All these new discoveries open new possibilities and fuel our curiosity about life beyond our planet. Who knows what exciting discoveries await us in the vast universe. Let's keep exploring and find out. Consider now Enceladus, Saturn's icy moon, one of the most promising places to look for life outside Earth. Scientists have just detected the last one of the six necessary ingredients for its formation, phosphorus. This rarest element has been discovered in an ocean on Enceladus. This rare element helps make the soil fertile on Earth. But the concentration of this mineral in the hidden seas on the distant moon might be from 100 to 1,000 times greater than in the oceans of our home planet. It might be because Enceladus' ocean is rich in carbonates, just like soda water, and this soda water is likely to dissolve the phosphates in the moon's rocks. The new discovery also suggests that on other icy moons of Saturn, like Titan, the waters may be loaded with phosphorus too. Why are scientists so excited about this mineral? Well, phosphates, which are compounds that contain phosphorus, are crucial components of life on Earth. DNA, RNA, and cell membranes contain them. But among those six elements required for life, which are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, phosphorus is the least common. In 2004, the Cassini space probe entered the dust from the second outermost ring of Saturn, called the E-ring. It's made up of ice grains in Cetalus ejects. And while studying these ice grains examined by Cassini's cosmic dust analyzer, researchers have detected phosphorus. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's not really large, only 314 miles across. 
This makes the space body small enough to fit inside Arizona. Hmm, we should try that sometime. Interestingly, when the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, astronomers thought that Enceladus was going to be a frozen ball of ice. But then, surprise, surprise, they spotted plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the moon's surface. It became clear that there was a global ocean between the moon's rocky core and its icy shell. The same researchers previously discovered that Saturn's moon might be home to complex organic molecules, too. Before, scientists thought phosphates could be trapped within the rocky cores of Enceladus and similar worlds. That's why the newest works, which hint that phosphates might also be abundant in the ocean, came as a surprise. Researchers examined 305 ice grains from Saturn's E-ring and found out that 9 of them contained phosphates. And these results were clear and unmistakable. And it's very important because some time ago, phosphine, a compound of hydrogen and phosphorus, was believed to exist in the clouds of Venus. But no one has managed to find any evidence to support this theory. On Enceladus, there's no controversy and phosphates do exist there. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking mission to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, as we are, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Then we've got Titan, Saturn's largest moon. It's smaller and has lighter gravity than Earth, but it still reminds us of our planet. Like on Earth, nitrogen dominates its atmosphere. Titan is the only other world in our solar system with lakes and rivers. These water bodies are made of hydrocarbons, methane, and ethane. There's also a subsurface ocean of water. But it's located very deep down, and no one has figured out yet if this ocean makes contact with anything under the surface. If it does, it could provide fuel for life after mixing with complex chemistry on the surface. But Enceladus and the other icy moons aren't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food and emitting, you know, gas. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the red planet. And it happened 600 times faster than the researchers' model accounted for. The question? What or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that might be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Ooh, that's a long shelf life. This means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the frozen temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, it's deeply frozen. Let it go. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Anyway, if we don't find life outside Earth in our solar system, 
we could probably look for it on exoplanets, which is what planets outside our star system are called. Some of them look very promising. The closest to Earth exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. It's a mere 4.2 light-years away from Earth. Recently, astronomers have found out that this world might resemble Earth even more than they previously thought. It's just 17% more massive than our home planet. It orbits a star that is dimmer and less massive than the Sun. Proxima Centauri b is in the middle of the star's habitable zone. This means that the chances of liquid water and life might exist on the planet. It looks like the exoplanet is tidally locked with its parent star. One of its sides faces the star at all times, and the other is always in the darkness. Scientists haven't figured out yet whether the planet has an atmosphere, is traveling too close to its star, and completes one orbit within 11 Earth days. The radiation from the star might be pulling the planet's air away. If this is the case, Proxima Centauri b isn't likely to have liquid water on its surface. Gliese 832c is 16.2 light-years away from Earth. In the cosmic scheme of things, it's a stone's throw away. This exoplanet is five times as massive as Earth and travels much closer to its parent star. That's why a year on this planet lasts a mere 36 days. But since this star is a red dwarf, much cooler and dimmer than the Sun, Gliese 832c gets as much light and heat as our planet. At the same time, it's still unclear if it's similar to Earth. The planet probably has a much thicker atmosphere that creates a runaway greenhouse effect. This phenomenon occurs when a planet absorbs more heat from its host star than it can release back into space. This means that Gliese 832c is more likely to resemble scorching hot Venus rather than the relatively cool Earth. Hey, I'm cool with that. Check out that buff dude over there with the orange skin. He's been chilling on Mars for a hot minute, which is why he looks like he used the wrong shade of self-tan. You see, all those carotenoids and carrots, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, and pumpkins are protecting him from those UV rays. The more he eats, the more orange he gets. And as for his sturdiness, it's all about that Martian gravity. The gravity here makes us perceive our weight differently. And if you want to be a boss on Mars, you gotta eat heavily. Like, if a person weighs 150 pounds on Earth, it feels like no more than 55 pounds on Mars. So, overeating can help shorten that gravity to weight gap. Mercury is a whole different thing. It's hotter than Georgia asphalt during the day, but colder than Elsa's castle at night. You gotta be made of metal with a high melting point to be able to survive here. But for us regular humans, we'd be toast. Literally. Even though Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, Venus is still the hottest one. Life on Venus. More like life on the Sun's evil twin. The temperature here typically hovers around 870 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Surviving at the boiling point of water, or in the extreme heat of Venus, is a challenge for most Earthly species. Only a select few can endure boiling hot temperatures. Others rush to Starbucks to grab an iced latte with the first beams of the spring sun. So no human being can really evolve enough to survive on Venus. The only creatures that could thrive there are probably tardigrades and those weirdos who put hot sauce on everything. You wonder what tardigrades are? Well, those are minuscule and adorable caterpillar-like creatures that possess remarkable durability. They can endure boiling water, the depths of a sea trench, and the frigid, lightless void of space. Recently, tardigrades were included in a scientific study aboard a spacecraft that unfortunately crashed on the moon. Scientists speculate that the tardigrades may have survived the impact. Hey, would you like to turn into this creature and live on Venus? We're done with terrestrial planets. Let's move on to gas giants. Now look at this dude from Saturn. He's got flippers and not arms. He's got small holes with no external ear flaps instead of regular ears. Most of this gas giant is colder than your ex's heart, as the temperature is about minus 220 F. You can't walk on it, but you can turn into a snowball or an ice crystal if you're feeling frisky. Things are quite similar on Jupiter, so probably turning into a seal and chilling there is not that bad of an idea. At least you can live there rent-free. And don't even get me started on Neptune and Uranus. These guys are ice giants with no solid surface, so those sharp-clawed dudes you see in movies? Yeah, they don't exist. Plus, these two ain't exactly hospitable to life. I'll stick to my sweet potatoes on Mars. Thank you very much.
You fly away from Earth at a safe distance in your super modern spaceship, and then BAM! You travel faster than the speed of light in interstellar space. How cool! The light from thousands of stars rushes past you. A few minutes, and you're on the other side of the Milky Way and going to work. Such travel has long been common for humans. For you are a member of the human civilization that has conquered the entire galaxy. But it took almost 90 million years to get there. So how did we achieve this? It's like a computer game. In the beginning, we had a fleet of three motherships that could travel at 310 miles per second. Each of them had 10 colonization pads. The ship could undock a pad and drop it on the desired planet. We also had two speed ships that traveled twice as fast but could only colonize one planet. Each colonized planet could send one new ship on an expedition. So humanity was able to spread across the galaxy in 90 million years. Most of that time was spent flying from star to star. So the main problem of colonization is speed. Year 2021. Our spaceships can now fly at about 24,850 miles per hour. That's enough speed to travel from New York to Los Angeles in less than 4 minutes. But a trip to neighboring planets like Mars still takes about 7 months. The nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away. That means light, the fastest thing in the universe, takes 4.2 years to get there from the Sun. It would take our rocket 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than an advanced human civilization has existed. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 105,000 light years wide. So even traveling at the speed of light would take forever. So naturally, humanity came up with other ways to travel. Let's move into the future and imagine that we've solved this problem. We started accelerating with microscopic probes propelled by a directional laser beam from Earth. This made it possible to reach speeds of 25% of the speed of light, still very slow. The problem was that nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light. So we moved on to the Alcubierre drive study. This method doesn't involve moving from point A to point B, but instead compressing the space between those points. Here's a piece of checkered paper. Imagine that you need to travel three squares to your destination. Instead of moving in a straight line as fast as possible, we squeeze these squares so that our spaceship is at point B. Now we unsqueeze them back. Space is normalized and we've traveled, in fact, standing still. This is how the Alcubierre drive works. It compresses space in front of the spaceship and expands it behind its tail. So, theoretically, an Alcubierre drive spaceship can move at any speed, even faster than the speed of light. But the amount of energy needed to do this is enormous, and it could be compared to the mass energy of the entire planet of Jupiter. So, while some scientists were working to improve the Alcubierre drive, others were looking inside the most mysterious object in the universe, a black hole. A black hole is something so heavy that it attracts even light and won't let it go. Imagine a circular trampoline. This is our space-time. We put a basketball in its center. The trampoline sags a little bit. Now all the objects we put on the trampoline will roll toward the basketball. That's how gravity works. But if you roll the golf ball past the basketball, it has a chance of getting out of this funnel. Now put a heavy bowling ball in the center of the trampoline. The trampoline sags even more. Now the golf ball will inevitably fall into the funnel with the bowling ball with no chance of escape. That's how a black hole works. And some scientists believe there may be a wormhole at the heart of a black hole. It's a shortcut between point A and point B in the universe. Back to our piece of paper. Instead of moving straight ahead, we fold the piece so that point A is right above point B. Now we make a hole in the paper and move to point B. We unfold it back and voila, you've arrived at your destination. So there's a theory that if a spaceship enters the black hole's gravitational field and withstands the incredible stress there, it can exit to any other point in the universe which that wormhole led to. It might even be another galaxy, or even a parallel universe. Well, our research was successful, and now, looking at a map...
neighboring worlds. So, for many millions of years, humanity has been weaving its web in the Milky Way. From one planet to another, we've colonized our galaxy. Humanity is now not only multiplanetary, but also interstellar. The next goal is to make us an intergalactic species. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is Jupiter. But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant, which means it's made up mostly of gases. Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperatures suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. But 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. The pressure of 23 atmospheres and still high temperatures finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star and its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system, because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened, and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our Sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our Sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So. It means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the Sun. And still, red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits, because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the Sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze, since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active. That's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. 
when Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It's also the second largest moon in the solar system, after Jupiter and Ganymede. And it's the only moon with clouds and a dense planet-like atmosphere. But the coolest thing? This moon might help us understand how life appeared on Earth. And for us to understand whether you like such videos or not, please put a like and subscribe to the channel. Your support is important to us. Thank you. Astronomers say that the conditions on Titan might be almost the same as those on Earth in its early years. 
The only significant difference is that, being closer to the sun, Earth has always been warmer. Titan is surrounded by an orange haze, which had kept the moon's surface a mystery for astronomers up until 2004. That's when the Cassini mission arrived there. Now we know that Titan's atmosphere extends about 370 miles high. That's a lot higher than the atmosphere of our planet. Because of this atmosphere, Titan was believed to be the largest moon in the solar system for a long time. But the most exciting fact about Titan's atmosphere is that it's full of organic compounds. If they were discovered on our planet, they would definitely mean life. Now, the atmosphere of Titan is mostly nitrogen mixed with a bit of methane and other organic compounds, which form when sunlight destroys methane. But if sunlight keeps destroying methane, how does this gas appear in the atmosphere again and again? On Earth, it's life itself that restores the supply of methane, since it's a byproduct of the metabolism of many organisms. So, can we conclude there's life on Titan? This distant moon isn't the most pleasant place to settle down. It's too cold for liquid water to exist on its surface. And still, Titan has rivers, seas, and lakes of liquid hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane. The largest of them are hundreds of feet deep and hundreds of miles wide. Beneath the thick crust of the moon, there is a more liquid ocean consisting primarily of water rather than methane. After a series of laboratory simulations, scientists concluded that there might be enough organic material on Titan for a chemical evolution to begin. It could be similar to the one that started life on Earth. But for that to happen, there must be liquid water on the moon for longer periods of time than what we observe now. And still, it might be another proof supporting the idea of a liquid water ocean under the frozen isolation layer. If it was true, Titan's subsurface ocean could turn out to be a place harboring life as we know it. Meanwhile, its lakes and seas of liquid hydrocarbons could have forms of life with different chemistry than what we're used to. Or there may be no life at all. After all, the temperature on the surface of Saturn's moon is about 290 OF. These conditions are far from comfortable for almost any life form. According to one theory, a meteorite impact that occurred a long, long time ago could have provided enough heat to liquefy water for around a few hundred or thousand years. But right now? Most experts think that Titan isn't likely to be a place where life thrives, which makes the presence of methane in the moon's atmosphere even more puzzling. Interestingly, Titan might become warmer in the future. You see, five to six billion years from now, the sun will become a red giant. It will heat up most space objects in our solar system, and Titan will become warmer, 94 OF. This temperature is high enough for stable oceans of a water-ammonia mixture to exist on its surface. With time, the sun's ultraviolet output will decrease, which will enable the greenhouse effect in Titan's upper atmosphere. The combination of these conditions might exist for several hundred million years, creating an environment suitable for the appearance of exotic forms of life. After all, this time was enough for life to evolve on Earth. The only thing that might hinder the process on Titan could be the presence of ammonia. It's likely to cause the same chemical reactions to proceed more slowly. Enceladus. Saturn's ocean-covered moon spews water into space non-stop. The liquid leaves the insides of the moon through fractures in its icy crust. In the mid-2000s, the Cassini spacecraft analyzed the composition of these jets and spotted molecules that included ammonia and carbon dioxide. Both compounds are crucial for the existence of life on Earth. But recently, scientists have made another analysis of the Cassini samples. And this study has revealed a great chemical diversity of Enceladus. It makes this small icy moon one of the top candidates for finding life in the solar system. In an attempt to find out the true chemical makeup of the moon, researchers at NASA examined the data collected in 2001 and 2012 again. All this information was gathered by NASA's Cassini-Huygens mission. It flew a spacecraft through the impressive water plumes of Saturn's moon many times. The samples were analyzed by a special instrument identifying compounds by their molecular weight. This instrument is called a mass spectrometer, and Cassini had one on board. The initial analysis showed that the jets contained five types of molecules. 
water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, and molecular hydrogen. But later, experts spotted a few bigger and heavier compounds, including ethane and hydrogen cyanide, as well as traces of methanol. The initial Cassini analysis didn't show these compounds because the equipment on board the spacecraft wasn't capable of identifying them. That's why it came as a surprise that Saturn's small moons could be so chemically active and able to produce heavy molecules. Together with previously found components like water and ammonia, the newly discovered molecules might serve as fuel and building blocks for microbes, which in turn means that they could probably support an independent origin of life. It's one of the reasons why, after the discovery of its oceans, Enceladus has been one of the main targets in the search for extraterrestrial life. The molecules might be mixing together through the hydrothermal activity on the moon's seafloor, creating a habitable environment where life could appear. So far, scientists haven't found any evidence that could indicate that such a process has actually been going on. Plus, no one knows yet how the erupting water makes its way through the icy shell of the moon. Still, the most recent findings might help ongoing and planned missions exploring other ocean worlds similar to Enceladus. One of such worlds is Jupiter's watery moon Europa. This place is likely to have the same properties as Saturn's moon. Hopefully, we'll get the answers to these questions soon with the help of the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer spacecraft. At the moment, it's on its way to the Jupiter system. But then another question might arise. If we found the conditions where life can originate and even thrive, can't this fact already be proof of the existence of extraterrestrial life? Doesn't it mean that life must be abundant in the universe? Then why haven't we come across other species yet? The answers to this paradox vary from optimistic to downright terrifying. It might be because we haven't been looking long enough, or maybe we haven't been emitting enough traceable signatures for other civilizations to find us, or perhaps no species have ever made it to the point where they could come into contact with other civilizations. There's also the frightening dark forest hypothesis. It's a theory claiming that loads of alien civilizations exist throughout the universe, but they are all silent and hostile. They try to maintain their undetectability for fear of getting destroyed by another unfriendly species. So, following this hypothesis, we can presume that any space-faring civilization must view other intelligent forms of life as an inevitable threat. And the best course of action is to hide its existence altogether. This makes the cosmic electromagnetic spectrum eerily quiet, with no evidence of any intelligent extraterrestrial life. This way, the universe can be compared to a dark forest filled with armed hunters wandering among trees like ghosts. Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick but it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, 
accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface, which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts. This is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride. You know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years, too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the Red Planet, and it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There. They might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium, due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, Scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists didn't have any evidence, since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens, or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. 
Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there. It can also be produced industrially. Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter or famous gas giants. But on Venus, totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere. But not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious. But they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. Ah, well-deserved vacay, finally. This time you're off to see something new. It's an ocean on one of the Uranus's moons. All right, just kidding. This destination is not a vacation spot yet. But yeah, there are definitely some impressive oceans out there. Hey, don't say you thought oceans can only be found on Earth. But before diving into Uranus moon's oceans, let's talk about Uranus itself first. The seventh planet from the sun and the coolest cat in the solar system. It's got 27 moons and four of them might technically have oceans. That's more than most people have friends. All these moons are like Uranus's mini-me's. They tilt at the same crazy angle as their parent planet, 98 degrees to be exact. And Uranus is so unique that it orbits the sun on its side. That means its equator is almost at a right angle to its orbit. Talk about rebellious. But why is Uranus like this? Well, some astronomers reckon it's because it got knocked on its side by a massive collision with another planet. And that impact might have actually created Uranus's moons. Fun fact, those moons have pretty particular names. Instead of mythical figures, most of them are named after Shakespearean characters. I mean, who needs Zeus when you've got Juliet and Desdemona? Discovering these moons isn't easy. They're super dark and located billions of miles away from the sun. It's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, except the needle is smaller than your pinky finger. These 27 satellites are divided into three groups. 13 inner moons, 5 major moons, and 9 irregular moons. The irregular ones are rebels with retrograde orbits, while the others are prograde and go with the flow of Uranus. The big boys are Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon, and they're all in Uranus's equatorial plane and are big enough to be round. They've got craters and canyons and cliffs. Oh my. These moons also formed from a giant impact that tilted Uranus on its axis. That's why they're all tilted too. And because of that tilt, they have crazy seasonal cycles just like Uranus itself. But we haven't found all of Uranus's moons yet. The little irregular ones are sneaky and hard to detect. So who knows how many more there could be. But let's talk about the really cool stuff. What these moons are made of. We're not entirely sure, but we think they're made of rock and ice. Miranda is the most icy one, while the inner moons are probably just dusty. And the ones beyond Oberon's orbit? They're likely captured asteroids that could be rocky, or icy, or who knows what. But here's what really sets Uranus's moons apart. They're all tilted together with Uranus. That's wild. Exploring these moons could teach us so much about how ocean worlds form and stay active. Titania is the biggest moon of Uranus, but it's still less than half the size of Earth's moon with a diameter of about 1,000 miles. It's also the eighth heaviest moon in the whole solar system. They named it after the Fairy Queen in A Midsummer Night's Dream. 
Titania's color is gray, and it has some shiny patches that scientists think are frost. It's made up of a mix of ice and rock, just like all the other moons close to Uranus. Oberon is the next biggest moon of Uranus, named after the fairy king in Shakespeare's play. It's almost the same size as Titania, and also has a half-ice slash half-rock composition. But Oberon's surface is way more cratered than the other Uranian moons. Umbriel and Ariel are the third and fourth largest moons of Uranus, with diameters of 726 miles and 718 miles respectively. Umbriel is named after a bad spirit in an old poem, and it's the darkest of all Uranus's big moons. It only reflects 16% of the light that hits it. Scientists don't know why it's so dark, but they think a bright ring around a crater might be caused by frost deposits. Ariel is the brightest of all Uranus's big moons, and it reflects over a third of the light that hits it. It's named after characters in both Pope's poem and Shakespeare's play. Ariel looks like the youngest moon, because it only has a few small craters from recent collisions. Miranda is the smallest of all these big moons, with a diameter of about 292 miles. NASA says it looks like it's made up of parts from different bodies, like a Frankenstein's monster. Miranda has three big features called Coroni that are unique to it. They're lightly cratered with ridges and valleys, and they're separated from older and more heavily cratered parts of Miranda by sharp boundaries. It also has giant canyons that are up to 12 times deeper than the Grand Canyon. Scientists don't know why Miranda has such different features, but one theory is that it got smashed apart by a huge collision and then put back together all wonky. All these big Uranian moons are stuck facing Uranus all the time, just like Earth's moon. Uranus has got some seriously dope features, but the ring system is where it's at. And get this, the ice giant's moons actually have a hand in shaping those rings. Uranus has 13 inner moons and 13 faint rings, and they're all connected like one big cosmic family. Cordelia and Ophelia are like the guardians of the outermost ring, Epsilon. These two shepherd moons keep all the particles together, with Cordelia being the closest to Uranus's surface. But here's the kicker. There are at least eight other tiny satellites hanging around in that area, making things super crowded. NASA is still scratching their heads trying to figure out how they don't all crash into each other. The inner moons are half ice and half rock, but we don't know much about the outer ones. NASA thinks they might just be asteroids that got caught up in Uranus's gravitational pull. Either way, Uranus and its moon squad are definitely out of this world. Apparently, Uranus's moons might have salty oceans hiding under their frozen surfaces, and the farthest ones from Uranus, Titania, and Oberon could have oceans that are 30 miles deep. That's deeper than the Mariana Trench, 7 miles. But even Ariel and Umbriel might have oceans around 19 miles deep. NASA used some fancy computer modeling and revisited data from their Voyager 2 spacecraft, launched way back in 1977, to figure out the makeup and structure of these moons. They found that Titania is huge enough to keep its internal heat and prevent its ocean from freezing. But get this, the other moons might have a chance at having warm oceans too. The researchers discovered potential sources of heat in the moon's rocky mantles that could release hot liquid and keep the oceans warm. And guess what? The oceans might even be warm enough to theoretically support life. The study also found that chlorides and ammonia are likely abundant in the oceans of these moons. Ammonia acts as antifreeze, and salts in the water could also help maintain the ocean's temperature. Now you might be thinking, how can these icy moons have liquid water? Well, turns out their internal heat and some chemicals could make it happen. For example, a study revealed that Chlorides and ammonia are likely abundant in the oceans of these moons. Ammonia acts as an antifreeze, and salts in the water could also help maintain the ocean's temperature. And if these moons really do have oceans, that means there could be other ocean worlds in our solar system and beyond. But don't get too excited. These oceans are pretty salty. About 150 grams of salt for every liter of water. That may not be saltier than Utah's Great Salt Lake, but still. As for Uranus's fifth biggest moon, Miranda, Welp. It might have had an ocean at some point, but it probably froze over pretty quickly. Poor little guy. Anyway, NASA is thinking about sending a mission to Uranus to learn more about these icy giants and their moons. They're calling it the Uranus Orbiter and Probe, UOP. Sounds like a party to me. So yeah, technically there might be not four, but even five oceans. But there's still much to learn and explore.
So Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. And apart from the bizarre shape, there's nothing remarkable about them, except for one thing. Not so long ago, scientists discovered a strange phenomenon on the surface of Phobos, and they still can't find any explanation for it. What is this phenomenon, and what does it tell us about the history of our solar system? Let's find out! American astronomer Asaf Hall discovered Phobos and Deimos back in 1877. Did you know that all the planets in our solar system are named after Greek and Roman deities? For example, Mars or Ares is the famous deity of war. That's why the satellites of this red planet were named after the sons of Ares, Phobos and Deimos. These beautiful names actually have creepy meanings. Fear and Horror in 1971, NASA's Mariner 9 telescope took the first pictures. That's how we found out that these guys weren't at all like our moon. They had this weird shape, a strange and unstable orbit. Moreover, there are no other moons in the solar system that move as close to their parent planet as these two. Well, they are its suns after all. But even though they are very close to Mars, if you were standing on the surface of the red planet, you would hardly be able to see them. That's because the curvature of Mars hides Phobos and Deimos from view. Even if you were somewhere on the equator, Phobos would look like an ordinary asteroid to you, and Deimos would look like a star. All because these satellites are basically crumbs compared to our moon. They're the smallest and least bright moons in the entire solar system, which is ironic considering their mighty names. Anyway, it seems that everything should be pretty clear with these two satellites. But nope, there's a problem. You see, scientists reconstruct the history of space based on the traces found on different space objects. Dents, scratches, cracks, all these things can tell us what happened billions of years ago. For a long time, scientists were sure that, just like their Greek prototypes, Phobos and Deimos were twins. But then, NASA's Viking orbiter took new photos of the satellites, and that's when they discovered a significant difference between the two. The entire surface of Phobos was covered with huge grooves. Those were a series of long, deep pits stretching from one end of Phobos to the other. You may say, what's the big deal? All space objects have this kind of stuff on them. And yeah, there are other satellites with similar grooves and scratches, but none of them has as many as Phobos. It's completely covered in grooves, and they're huge, up to 12 miles long and 660 feet wide. And that's not all. Some of these grooves intersect with others. This means that Phobos has experienced not one, but many traumatic events. But what exactly happened to it? Actually, scientists are still not completely sure. However, they have a few ideas, and these theories can tell us not only about the past of Phobos, but also predict its future. Theory 1. Asteroid Impact Well, the first suspect is quite obvious. There's a large, almost 6-mile-wide crater on Phobos. It's called Angeline Stickney. It was named after the wife of Asaf Hall, the scientist who discovered the satellites. Adorable. So that's what the first theory sounds like. Once upon a time, an astronomical body crashed into Phobos. The impact was so strong that it left a large crater. And the effect of the collision left a bunch of grooves everywhere on Phobos. It sounds logical at first. However, scientists have noticed a flaw in this theory. They learned that these grooves actually formed not inside the crater, but next to it. So it wasn't a collision that created them. Besides, what about those grooves that intersect with the others? Or is it just a big cosmic coincidence? Well, the search for truth continued. Theory 2. It's all because of space debris. Yes, there's a difference between these two theories. In this case, the grooves aren't a direct consequence of the collision. Rather, it goes something like this. Something crashed into Phobos. This impact caused a bunch of rocks to be thrown into space. Some of them were lost in the universe forever, but others were small enough to be pulled back to Phobos. Passing next to the moon at a steep angle, they would crash into it, jumping away, and so on. 
And since the gravity of Phobos is very weak, perhaps they couldn't stick to it. In other words, these rocks were continuously pulled toward and pushed off of the satellite for many, many years. This theory explains the intersecting grooves. It's because the rocks were constantly falling into those places. It sounds quite logical, but there's another problem. We don't see any boulders on Mars or on the surface of its moons. But all this debris was supposed to get trapped by gravity and remain somewhere in the planet's orbit. This or simply become part of Phobos. In other words, if this were true, we'd find evidence of this theory under layers of dust. But that didn't happen, so this explanation didn't satisfy astronomers either. Therefore, they continued to look for the culprit. Maybe the grooves have nothing to do with Stickney Crater at all. Maybe the real culprit is something else, something even more powerful. Could it be Mars itself? Theory 3. Mars is a twist villain. The previous theories imply that Phobos and Deimos were originally pieces of Mars. Like once upon a time they broke away from it and became satellites, just like our moon. But what if that wasn't the case? Observations made by NASA's Mars Global Surveyor show that Phobos and Deimos are made up of elements which are mainly found in meteorites and asteroids. So, what if Phobos and Deimos are asteroids? There's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Given the size, shape, and composition of Phobos and Deimos, scientists have suggested that once upon a time, they belonged to this belt. However, one day, they flew out of it, and then gravity pulled them to Mars. This phenomenon is called asteroid capture. It's very strange, though. Yeah, the asteroid capture isn't uncommon, but these two have been flying next to Mars for what, billions of years? It's weird that their orbits have remained the same. In addition, the atmosphere of Mars is very rarefied, and because of this, it could hardly capture any asteroids. In theory, they should have separated from Mars at the first opportunity. However, this didn't happen. It means that somehow, they got stuck and Mars immediately began to destroy them. Yep, an unexpected twist. In this version, Mars turns out to be a villain. By studying the past, we've found some evidence of future crimes. The mysterious grooves of Phobos could be caused by tidal forces between Mars and Phobos. The Moon and Earth also exchange these, slightly distorting each other. But since Phobos is much closer to Mars, the impact of gravitational forces is much stronger. In other words, the gravity of Mars is gradually destroying Phobos. Every 100 years, the satellite gets 0.7 inches closer to Mars. It also shrinks as much as 6.5 feet, becoming even more fragile and weaker. The smaller it gets, the more the tidal forces impact it, creating strange grooves and scratches on Phobos. Yep. Somewhere in 30 to 50 million years, Phobos will either collide with Mars or disintegrate and turn into a bunch of small rocks. And then Mars will also have rings, like Saturn and Neptune. That's why Phobos is called the doomed Martian moon. Anyway, these are all only theories, but the dramatic backstory of Phobos gives us an idea of how dynamic extraterrestrial objects can be. The more we learn about them, the more we discover about the secrets of the origin of not only Mars, but also other objects in our solar system. If one day we really colonize Mars, studying its moons can help us a lot. Let's hope that the upcoming MMX mission will reveal some of the most exciting secrets Mars's moons are hiding. Wow, the NASA hotline is ringing off the hook. The call center operator is all sweaty from stress. They barely have time to answer the phone, and all the messages they get say the same thing. There's something glowing on the moon. Indeed, hundreds and thousands of amateur astronomers were watching the moon that night. And suddenly, there was a bright light on it, as if someone had lit a powerful spotlight on the surface. Scientists immediately began to look for an explanation to this phenomenon. They first thought it was simply the glow of an airplane flying between the observers and the moon. 
But then it wouldn't have been seen by so many people from different parts of the world at the same time. The next suspects were the Starlink satellites. Theoretically, one of them could have played a cruel trick on amateur astronomers. They could have mistaken the small satellite's light for a flash of light on the moon. But then again, if the satellite were the culprit of this mess, the flare wouldn't be static, but moving. While some scientists continue to search for an answer to this mystery, others decide to investigate the phenomenon in more detail. For this purpose, they have built a new telescope north of Seville, Spain. The conditions there are quite suitable for observing the moon. The telescope has two cameras, controlled remotely from the campus in Germany. If both cameras pick up any unusual phenomenon on the surface of the moon, it will quickly zoom the telescope there to see what's going on. It'll also require advanced artificial intelligence to teach the cameras to distinguish between the unexplained phenomenon on the moon and the light of an airplane, a satellite, or a small meteorite that just entered the Earth's atmosphere. While the telescope is doing its investigation, we already have a theory that may explain the appearance of such bright round flashes on the moon's surface. So, the moon influences the tides of the seas and oceans on Earth with its gravitational force. But the Earth can affect the moon in the same way. Only the force will be 32 and a half times stronger. While the moon orbits the Earth, at one point, it may be as close to our planet as possible. Then the force of the interaction will be greatest. At this point, tidal forces may force cracks in the surface of the moon to open and release gas from its interior. A powerful jet of gas will lift the lunar dust with it. And what we see as a bright flash through our telescopes is really just a fog of dust, which is round and reflects sunlight well. If you look at it from a distance, it really does look like a flash. As the dust rises, we think there's been a small explosion. And that flash gradually fades as the dust settles down. These things happen all the time on the moon's surface. They're called transient lunar phenomena. And besides lunar flashes, much more mystical and bizarre things have happened. Back in 1178, five monks claimed to have seen the moon, being in the shape of a horn, begin to split in two from an upper point. Then, fire and sparks began to blaze from the place of separation. It was as if a dragon were spewing flames. In the next moment, the moon began to pulsate and then returned to its calm state. This phenomenon was repeated more than 10 times, and the flames took different shapes each time. When this nightmare was over, the moon turned black. It wasn't until the 20th century that scientists tried to explain the phenomenon. They theorized that a large asteroid collided with the moon at the time. And it was this asteroid that should be blamed for creating the Giordano Bruno crater, 15 Brooklyn bridges wide. But in that case, millions of tons of fragments from the asteroid would have hit the Earth as well. And then, people would have seen an incredible meteor shower. It would have been very bright, and the memories of it would definitely have been in the archives. But that didn't happen. Now, the phenomenon the monks observe seems questionable. Perhaps they did see an asteroid fall. Only it was falling on the Earth itself, and they perceived the light from the burning meteorite as something sinister happening on the moon. Or maybe the monks were simply imagining things. There's no witnesses to this event other than them. Another unusual phenomenon is the blue and red lights on the moon. They can be seen when it's horn-shaped. And this occurs most often in the Aristarchus crater. The flashes come and go very quickly, almost like lightning. In fact, this is electricity. Tidal forces are to blame for this too. They cause mechanical stress to build up in the rocks. This can produce an electric field, which creates the blue flashes that have surprised many amateur astronomers. There can also be starbursts on the moon. We can blame this on meteorites that fall on the surface. Because the moon has no atmosphere, asteroids that approach it don't burn up. Having a lot of weight and speed, they cause an explosion on impact. And here on Earth, we see it as a starburst. For example, on May 13, 1972, there was a meteorite impact of 1,000 tons of TNT near where Apollo 14 landed. 
If we live much earlier, we might have witnessed constant bright flashes on the moon's surface. All the craters there are formed by such meteor strikes. So imagine the fireworks that were there years ago. And a lot of those meteorites were even useful, too. They brought water with them. Yes, there is water on the moon. NASA confirmed this fact after studies with the SOFIA telescope. It was mounted on an airplane. The observations were made from the upper atmosphere of the Earth. At such an altitude, the dry air allowed the telescope to see even the smallest details. Water might have been in the craters at the poles of the moon. These places have never seen light, and the water there might be encased in ice. But Sophia found water on the sunlit surface of the moon. Of course, it's only H2O molecules that are present in the dust layers. But that's something. If we manage to collect all this water, we'll get very little of it. In comparison, the Sahara Desert has about 100 times more water than we found on the moon. But an even more unusual phenomenon is happening there right now. The moon is actually rusting, just like a piece of old metal. For rust to appear, we need iron, water, and oxygen. Lunar soil has enough iron in it, and as we've already learned, there's some water too. The last piece of the puzzle is oxygen. Everyone knows there's no atmosphere on the moon, and we can't breathe there. But oxygen is still present. The solar wind brought it there. The wind from our warm star moves at an extremely high speed. It scrapes oxygen from the upper parts of our atmosphere and carries it further through space. Eventually, the wind with the oxygen molecules reaches the moon. Voila! All the ingredients for corrosion are in place, and the iron ore on the surface of the moon begins to take on a reddish hue. If this process goes on long enough, in the distant future, the moon will look like Mars. It will turn orange-red. Yes, the signature color of Mars came exactly from that corrosion that began there thousands and thousands of years ago, when there were rivers and seas with water and an atmosphere with oxygen. Other strange objects that can be seen on the moon were left there by humans. Between 1969 and 1972, 12 people visited there as part of the Apollo program. In all, there were six landing sites where the astronauts left a bunch of stuff behind. Besides a couple of dozen satellites and spacecraft that fell or landed softly on the moon, there's a lunar rover, some United States flags, a family photo of one of the astronauts, and even three golf balls. And the first two people to be on the moon left behind a whole pile of stuff. When they were about to go home, they took a lot of soil samples and rocks with them. And to carry it all away, they had to get rid of everything unnecessary on board the lunar module. The TV camera, the sample collection tools, the science equipment, and even the armrests from the seats. The astronauts stood outside the lunar module for a full 8 minutes and threw out a whole mountain of unnecessary items. If you collect all these objects and debris that we left there by 12 astronauts and put them on the scales, it will show about 199 tons. It's like three heavy armored tanks or three large passenger planes. Strange, but true.